Um, so we're now into module six. And as I said, hopefully the road gets a little easier now. We've spent the first day and a bit, um, as I said, looking into the under the hood, learning about the details. And what we want to do now is introduce you to two concepts um, or programming libraries called Keras and SciCat Learner, S-C-K-S-K-L, um, to help with doing easier, simpler uh, coding. So uh, this will be about an hour and a half uh, in terms of time. Uh, it might go a little faster, so again, we'll have a bit more time for the, the lab component or exercises. Um, so what we're going to do now, and both for this lecture and then the next one, uh, is, is get you familiar with two things. One is called scikit learn, and the other one is Keras. Um, and, and the point was sort of to take you on the initially tough journey of looking at how things are coded in pure Python or pure R. Um, and using you know, standard coding methods, but then to show how you can significantly shorten that coding effort and simplify it um, using scikit-learn and Keras. So the first thing we're going to do is focus on the iris classification problem, and we're going to look at decision trees. And we're going to use scikit-learn or sklearn, as, as they can call it. So that's the decision tree. And then we're going to show how you could do the artificial neural net iris classifier also using sklearn. But we're also going to throw in Keras, which is a library that's really useful for, for neural nets. And we're then going to show how this can be done for CoLab. All right, for sklearn, it's, it's an open source library um, and it's designed for particularly things like decision trees or random forests. Um, and it's been around for about 15 years. You can find more about um, sklearn on this link here and you're welcome to, to browse around it as I'm talking. Um, the other thing we're going to be talking about is Keras. Um, and Keras is a, a library that was developed in TensorFlow. And TensorFlow is something that was developed by Google and first released in 2015. And Keras was released in 2017. So these are application programming interfaces or APIs uh, that allow you to do neural nets and neural net calls in a very easy way. And it does both the simple shallow artificial neural nets as well as the deep learning neural nets. Again, you can go to TensorFlow uh, to find out more about Keras and find out again the, about the APIs that you're able to use. So TensorFlow, um, this is sort of a bit of a background, but I think you can probably find more about it um, maybe by um, looking at some videos. But um, the reason why they came up with the word TensorFlow is because tensors are another term for tables or matrices or vectors. And um, what TensorFlow does is it makes um, computer graphs, computational graphs to allow those visualizations. So they have operation objects, or TensorFlow operation objects that represent sort of units of computing. And they can also represent the units of data that flow between the operations. And so these graphs run with something called sessions. So this is a data flow graph animation that's showing, you know, here's some input and then we're doing a, a, a ReLU um, scoring layer, a logit or sigmoidal layer. Um, we have uh, calculations for softmax um, activation potentials, some cross entropy calculations. We can adjust the learning rate. Um, so each of the nodes, which this is essentially a graph, is a, a mathematical operation, the logit layer, the ReLU layer, um, the cross entropy layer, the softmax um, node, all of those are um, mathematical operations. And then the edges, so those are the arrows, um, are um, the data set in which those operations are performed. So the data gets transformed as it goes through 
from the input to the reshape to the um, relu and logit layer and class labeling and cross entry entropy all the way up. So that's the way it's it's modeled. Um, that's why they call it a sort of a flow diagram because things are flowing through these arrows um, to the nodes. And as I said, the the nodes are operations. Um, the, the sessions collect both the edges and the nodes together, um, and then it uses a whole bunch of devices. Um, you can access both CPUs and with especially the deep learning tools, GPUs. So when we talk about modules um, or libraries, we've already worked with some like NumPy and Pandas. So NumPy for math, and Pandas for um, handling um, text files of different formats. Um, and so all we're doing with uh, Keras and SKLearn is calling these um, modules or libraries or um, sections of codes and classes. So Keras, as we said, is the one that's used for creating, training, testing, both shallow artificial neural nets and deep um, GNNs, CNNs, RNNs, the, the deep neural nets. And then SKLearn is separate because it's best for things like decision trees and random forests, and it has those functions that allow you to do those operations um, much more quickly. So I think most of you are familiar, obviously, with um, libraries and with functions. And this is really what Keras and SKLearn is provide the libraries and functions to do this stuff. So if we write pip install, because you guys just did pip install um, for NumPy, you can do pip install TensorFlow. And this is how you can call up um, the TensorFlow library to get um, Keras. So pip um, is this thing called a recursive acronym, um, um, which means it sort of says itself over and over again. So PIP installs packages. And if you take P is for pip, I for install, and P for packages, then you get pip again. Some people might be familiar with the Zinc um, uh, database, which I think is a recursive acronym for Zinc is um, non something. Anyways, there's lots of recursive acronyms that are used in computing these days. So if you recall, one of the first things we did in um, module two um, yesterday was, was try and create a, a, a decision tree to classify iris flowers. And we called that program iris DT for uh, IP, Y, and B. And so now we're going to have one iris DT SK learn. And remember, the SK Learn or Scikit Learn is the one that has the modules and libraries for decision trees. Um, so we're going to use um, the function in SK Learn called Decision Tree Classifier. Um, so that's something you're going to have to remember. And so we're going to frame it as we have before in terms of um, how do you do a, um, a standard workflow for machine learning. And as before, we're just going to you know, classify RS fires based on floral dimensions. Going to use the training and testing sets that we've had before. This is one you guys remember from yesterday. So it was 150 flowers, 50 each of Setosa, Virginica, and Versicolor. And we're measuring petal and sepal length and width. And each of these can be classified according to that. We saw the table of data that was collected back in 1935 um, in Quebec. And this is the data that we're using for the training. Um, we've also learned how to you know, transform and collect the da data. So this is what the CSV file looks like with the information on petal dimensions and species type. Um, we're now in module six. So if you guys wanted to go there, you can go to the Python code. Uh, for module six. And in this case, it's not um, 
Iris DT4. It's um, it's Iris DT4 SK Learn that we're going to try and grab. Um, now, again, as a reminder, the old Iris decision tree was you know read the data, check the data, create the training and testing sets where we did that split of 70-30. We had a function called splitting, which was to do um, make the decisions um, left or right um, nodes. We also did a Gini index calculation. We did Gini index because it was faster than calculating uh, information gain by entropy. We developed an optimal split function, uh, which would scan through the Gini index to find the best split or best number uh, to cut things off. We created a terminal node function, which would make the decision and said that had you completed um, a separation that was successful and that there are no more um, no, no more decisions or no more splitting. So that is creating an, a pure node is what we call it. Um, and um, we had the recursive splitting function, which has been applied to the impure nodes and would split until we received or generated um, uh, pure nodes again. And then the program called it and trained it. And that was the, the entire DT4. Um, if we used SK Learn uh, instead of being the eight or nine steps that we had with the old one, it's we just read the data via the SK Learn data sets function. I call a data set split function via the train test split uh, library. And then we call decision tree classifier to do the decision tree process. And then we just tell it to repeat that until a depth of four is reached. So all you really have to do is just decide what depth you want. So you could choose three, you could choose two, you could choose four or five. And those are your parameters that you get to play with. So if we're writing this um, for uh, Python, um, well, we, we still have to import the NumPy and Pandas. Um, but we also, um, now, instead of writing the, the, the read function and the, the data um, location function that we've had before, um, we write this text. We write sklearn data sets. Um, we import NumPy as NP. We, from sklearn, import data sets. Uh, we have a PD data frame. Um, and this code obviously is much smaller than what we had to write before. Um, we have to do the training and test set. And you recall that we had, you know, we calculated 7030. The code for that was relatively lengthy. Um, this is the sklearn package. Uh, I'm going to use the train test split method. That's what we're importing. Um, and that is how we handle the data. The next thing we have to do is um, train the model. And in this case, the, the training is, is from the decision tree classifier. And all we're having to do is make a decision about what our max depth should be. And this one, we could have guessed three, we could have guessed four, we guessed four. Um, and in this case, we have um, the classifier predicting either for one observation or for multiple observations. Um, and that's all that we have to do in terms of the training. Um, now, that whole process has to be repeated. Um, so we call that decision tree classifier um, uh, for the maximum four times. And it does the classification fit, produces the score, prints the accuracy, and evaluates the feature importance, which is um, how it's doing the problem with the Gini calculation. So if you recall um, with the original decision tree program, which was fairly efficiently programmed, um, I think we're dealing with close to 100 lines. Uh, this one's about 60 lines. The number of coding lines is just 50. And 
we find out that this SK31 is quite a bit faster. Um, Again, this is the old one. So the total number of lines is about 100 coding lines with comments is about 123. So we've rewritten the program and it's now able to do um, uh, the same thing, same functions as what the original IRIS decision tree did. And as before, you have to test it and validate it. So we trained initially on 70% of the data sets, and then we're validating on the 30%. There's also um, a, a way of visualizing uh, decision trees, and um, graph viz is a function that you can actually import, and it will take the data that we had from our decision tree and produce actually a very impressive and very useful uh, image that describes the process and the functions and the cutoffs um, that were used. And so this is another useful thing from scikit-learn. So this is actually the graph is result. And um, if you guys remember the decision tree, uh, recall that we were using a Gini index to make our decisions and to find the sort of the, the central or highest performing node. And it turns out that petal width is the root node. Um, and that gave a Gini index of 0.665. Um, so not near zero, but at least that was good enough. Um, and then from there, it used um, the petal width um, to separate um, the Satosa set from the Virginica and um, Versa color. So the brown one is the terminal node, um, or orange, I guess, if you want to color it. So all 37 Satosa uh, were classified. And so the information or Gini index um, is zero. If we used um, now a petal length, uh, which instead of the petal width is being used, um, then we're also able to get um, a high or reasonably high information split. And so we can see that the Versicolor and uh, Virginica based on petal length are, are separated um, into two classes. And we almost get um, a terminal node in terms of um, Virginica. Um, and we almost, that's how the gene index is zero. And with the genie petal width um, or petal length with the versicolor, it's still not quite zero. So we can do some further splits. And the idea again is to try and get a genie index of zero. So by, I guess, the third or fourth layer, uh, I guess it's technically the third layer, we see that we terminate uh, on the far right side uh, with a genie index of zero for the virginica, at least for some of them. We still have a few samples that we need to protect and then we also see with the Versa color, we terminate where we get um, most of the samples separated with the Gini index, but there's still a few left over. And then we do another split, and we finally see that we get a full split of here and uh, for Versa color. So the Versa color are, are now fully split out. Same way with the Virginica, they also split out to terminal Gini indices. So in the end, at this fourth layer, all of the results are zero, 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 and zero. We have other ones at zero and zero, uh, non-zero here, but another one zero here. So we started out with a moderately high Gini index, but by doing appropriate splits, we get terminal nodes here, terminal nodes here, terminal nodes here, and terminal nodes all the way through. So Tiffany, you had a question? Yeah, maybe I'm just missing something, but the it looks like on the sepal width and petal width on the, I guess, the last classification, how did they yeah. terminate on each species since they're both less than or equal to the same value? Um, so this one, um, if it's less than 3.1, it's classified as Virginica. And then if it's more than 3.1, it's Versicolor. 
Oh, I see. Okay, so I did just miss that. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, so, and I, there's a question, sorry to interrupt. There's a question in the Slack and I stepped away for a moment, so I'm not sure if it's already been answered, but is there a rationale for why the default value for random state in train test split is none? As in, is it best practice to randomly subset the training and test sets every time and deliberately not use the same sets or does it not really matter? It shouldn't matter. Um, the, um, you know, if the data is sufficiently, um, balanced and this this data is balanced we've got you know 50 of each um, and if it's presented in a random way then any random grab will produce um, appropriate or at least it has to be more than um, 60 or 70 in your training set um, you should get a pretty good random distribution we're doing you know 70 percent as a grab um, I don't know, does that explain it? Yeah, that question was for me. Um, I just have noticed that for me, I always set a C before I do anything random so that I can reproduce what I did next time I'm testing something. But it yeah. seems like that isn't, hasn't been done in the code that we've been looking at. And I wonder if that's just because it doesn't matter at all or is it a deliberate choice? Um, the data itself that we're using for this was was randomized enough um so um in this case it doesn't matter what about in general yeah in general if you're going to be doing a random seed to try and parse out data yeah choose a random seed stick with it so that it'll be consistent um but it's also really important to, to look at your data um data balancing is really important and maybe we didn't emphasize it enough so you know this this iris data set is nicely balanced it's you know 50 of each. It's not 10, 60, and um, I don't know, 80. It's if you had an unbalanced data set, um, you're going to have problems. And um, this goes back to sort of the discussions of normalization and scaling and um, applying. Um, you know, some people will create dummy data. Some people will. To, to balance the data sets. Uh, others will spend more time seeing if they can get more data to finally balance it. Um, there's also you know, performance parameters that are important. Um, so if you've got a well-balanced data set, then if you're doing random selection, then things should work out. If you don't have a balanced data set, then doing random selection will still lead to potentially problems. Um, and you'll see this if you do n fold cross validation, uh, where you'll get you know, some models doing incredibly well and then others doing really poorly. Um, and ideally, if everything's balanced, all the models should do roughly equally well. OK, thank you. That explains it. You just want to add that if there's an uh, imbalanced data set, then there's uh, other techniques like stratified cross validation to make sure that uh, even after being randomized, uh, the different folds have the same ratio of different classes to make sure that it doesn't get, uh, it, the folds don't get biased. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, but uh, usually it's better to just spend a bit of time <laughs> trying to balance your data sets. And, and this is why I, I, I really encourage people to spend the time to get their data be familiar with their data, balance their data. Um, you know, you may be in you know, a difficult situation where it's inherently unbalanced. Um, and basically you have to live with it. Um, and then you can use things like stratified uh, methods. Tiffany, you had another question? Yeah, I just was wondering if there's anything immediately obvious in a resulting decision tree that would indicate your root no, node is not like the best um, initial splitting point to start on. Like, for instance, if you see that same classifier like showing up multiple times, like in downstream nodes, does that indicate maybe it's not like the best one to use initially, or I don't know, anything like that? Well, if you're looking at the decision tree, and I, I mean, this is what's so nice about this visualization um, is, you know, it does allow you to potentially troubleshoot things. 
remember that the Gini index, the low Gini index is how we um, try and identify the, the best root nodes or the best nodes to then proceed to the next child nodes. Um, so we can see that the top root node, the best we could get had a Gini index of 0.665. You know, ideally you'd like to have a somewhat lower one, but if you've got that, then it tells you you're gonna have to do some, you know, multiple layers uh, to, to really get things split out. And so it progressively gets smaller um, throughout the Gini index, you know, 0 0.665, 0 0.496, 0 0.153, uh, 0.375, eventually everything gets you know, zeroed out here. Um, we're seeing that we, we had pedal width as the first one, pedal length the second one, but then we're seeing pedal width again to split. So it's being used again, but but that's um, one was using just to identify Satosa. The other was to get you know Virginica and Verto and, and Versicolor, you know, all lumped together. So then to split Virginica and Versicolor, we go back to pedal width again. Yeah, um, that makes sense. I was I was kind of thinking like with the feature selection for the neural networks, like if you're constructing a decision tree, may you have missed like key features that would do a better job of splitting groups um, that are that weren't even included in like the gene calculation. Yeah, so this is why you use this genie index calculation or information gain, the other one, but both of those are used to make your decision about what's your first node, what are the first ones to, to work with. Now with a random forest, it's possible where it might choose a suboptimal one. It might choose maybe, I don't know, um, sepal width initially. And maybe that gives you a Gini index of 0.72. Um, and then it does its own splitting and comes up with its own route to, to get something. Um, and, you know, it, it's just like, you know, driving from home to, to work. There's probably multiple routes. There's an optimal route, and then there's a slightly less optimal route. But maybe on days where there's a traffic accident, the less optimal route is faster. Um, and this is partly what random forests do: is that they'll potentially randomize the decision of which Gini index um, is the best one to put your root node in, or it might randomize some of these other ones further down, where it's sort of a flip of a coin. You know, Here's a genie index of 0.153, and maybe there's one at 0.155. Good enough, I and mean, that might have been sepal length. Um, so you know, that could have been a different node. So a decision tree, uh, you know, in this case, it's so simple and so obvious. Um, there probably aren't too many alternate paths, but for more complex data sets, um, there are multiple decision trees that could be mostly optimal and and that's why we create random forests okay that makes sense thank you okay we spent a fair bit of time on this one but i think as i say this is a really nice visualization that can come from um these these packages these libraries so when we run this um decision tree using uh, sk learns library we get um a perfect result in terms of returning data. So the confusion matrix shows diagonals of one, off diagonals of zero, and we should be very happy. Of course, the next thing we have to do is now test the holdout set. And this one is not quite perfect. Uh, it's mostly ones along the off diagonal, and there's a confusion between Versicolor and Virginica, which is not unexpected. Um, now, if we look at the old coat um, that we originally had, that was with our own decision tree methods and our own handwritten algorithms. Training was perfect. The testing was also imperfect, but with slightly different numbers, um, just to come back. So really not much difference, but the fact that there is a difference just reflects um, maybe just some differences in, I don't know, efficiency code. It may also have been, I'm not sure exactly what the test and the split were um, for these. So what we've tried to illustrate with this is that for the first day, we took you guys up the mountain sort of the hard way. 
um, we showed you the uh, the inside the hood look of, of coding for decision trees and then also for neural nets. What SK Learn does is it allows you to do the same thing, but you know, taking the helicopter route. It's just a lot easier. Code is simpler, performance is comparable. And, and this is how most people now code for machine learning. They use these libraries. And, and there's you know, other libraries you can use, but for the decision tree and neural nets, the ones we're choosing are um, SK Learn and, and the Keras library. So um, yesterday was a tough haul. I, hopefully today uh, is more like the escalator helicopter ride up. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Uh, and maybe now you understand the method to the madness. <laughs>